Hello everyone, my name is Konstantin and today I'd like to present our recent work on security analysis of RDMA technology and how it influences NVMe over Fabrics protocol. But before actually talking about NVMe, I would like to explain what is the difference between socket-based networking and RDMA networking. In the traditional socket-based networking, uh, network packets arrive to the network controller which would simply DMA these packets to the network driver, which is runs in the kernel space. Then the kernel space, uh, this kernel space network driver would match the packets, and if they correspond to a connection from the user application, it would copy the content uh, of the payloads to the receive buffer of the user application. Of course, connections can be also created from the kernel space, and in that case, the data would be copied the kernel module that created that particular connection and this packet, uh, if this packet go, corresponds to that connection. In the case of RDMA, we have special uh, controller on the device called RDMA controller that helps us to fully process the packets on the NIC. So what, what it means that the connections, they're not managed in the kernel space, they fully exist on the device. So the device can fully process a request and actually copy the content of the of the packets directly to the receive buffer of the applications without involving the OS or the kernel at all. And of course, if the connection was created from the user space, the data would go to the uh, user space and also kernel modules can create RDMA connections. And in that case, the, the network controller would DMA the content to the receive buffer belonging to the kernel module. But actually I'd like to show today, if we go into that settings when we have operating system and then we have user application kernel modules using RDMA, then actually if we have an adversary, we just have user access. So it's normal user on this operating system, then it can actually impersonate any user application. So it can impersonate any connection created by the uh, any user application, and it can do it without administrative privileges. As well as it can impersonate uh, kernel uh, connections created by the kernel modules. So it means it can send messages on behalf of the kernel modules. And the discuss uh, and the vulnerability that I will discuss today, it actually applies to all InfiniBand based protocols. So it goes to InfiniBand as well as Rocky uh, protocols. Now I'd like uh, actually focus on the implications of, of this uh, vulnerability. So if we can actually uh, manipulate any local RDMA connection, then as I mentioned, we can also manipulate connections created by the kernel modules. But if we can impersonate connections of the kernel modules, then we can actually bypass the checks of operating system that exist, and then we can do something on the behalf of the kernel modules, depending how the, these kernel modules use RDMA. And this is particularly dangerous for NVMe Hall Fabrics a kernel module that actually is capable of sending uh, accesses to the remote block devices. And here I will show how we could use it, uh, this vulnerability to gain block access of, for the device, to the devices that attach with NVMe or Fabrics protocol. So <coughs> before actually saying what is NVMe or Fabrics, I'd like to briefly discuss what this NVMe protocol is. So NVMe protocol was designed to have uh, zero copy communication from CPU to the SSDs. So this protocol is implemented on top of PCI Express protocol. It's executed by dedicated engines of NVMe devices, and it has a low latency. It achieves high bandwidth. It goes at the speeds of, it can go to the speeds of NVMe Express interconnect, and it has low CPU utilization as the all data copies happen uh, by the engines. But you can see the problem of the regional NVMe uh, protocol that PCI Express bus has limited number of slots. So you cannot attach hundreds of disks to one machine. 
to actually extend this idea that was proposed in Vimeo of Fabrics protocol, where the idea is that this NVMe request, they will not be sent to the local device, they would be actually sent over a network to a remote machine, which would run this target application, a Vimeo Fabric target, and then it would actually submit this request to their local devices. Of course, to still have this lower latency, high bandwidth, and, and, uh, and have like low CPU utilization, the decision was to use RDMA as RDMA interconnects offers exactly the same guarantees. It would be zero copy, bypass of the OS, it would have really low overhead to the NVMe protocol. And this is exactly the setting that I would like to talk today. So imagine that we have two machines, we have a remote node, which has SSD attached, and then we have a local node that mounted this remote disk with NVMe Fabrics protocol. And they interconnected with RDMA protocol, so it could be any InfiniBand architecture based protocol. And let's imagine that this attacker is located on the local node where this disk is mounted. So, what it actually means for this particular case, so this uh, local node, it mounted this remote SSD, uh, it installed file system on it, and of course in that settings if we have a user and it wants to use this block device, so it doesn't have privileges to use block device directly, it can only use it through a file system and the file system would have uh, various checks, so it would check the permissions of the user, whether it's allowed to create the file or access the file, but actually what I will show because of vulnerabilities in the InfiniBand architecture, this adversary, it can completely bypass the file system, it can bypass NVMe of Fabric client, and it can go directly to the IP verbs and just send requests to this remote machine. So it would completely bypass all the checks that exist in the operating system. And I will demonstrate it on this uh, the simplest request that exists in the NVMeo fabric. So it's right in capsule. What it means that the client builds a request, send it over the network with RDMA send. This message would be received uh, by the target. It would take this capsule from the receive buffer and then it would execute it on the local device. Then after we get the completion, it will send back a response saying about successful uh, completion of this operation. What is actually this RDMA sent? What is actually sent over the network? Over the network, it, it sends a typical InfiniBand based packet. So it would have like routing header, which defines how we route the packet. It would have the transfer header, which we have some information about connection ID and the, a packet sequence number, then it would have a payload which actually encapsulates uh, the, this NVMe write capsule. So it would encapsulate the request and then it has a checksum. So it's kind of typical uh, network packet. And actually how it's processed, so as I said, the connection exists on the device. So the device would check that this packet is correct. Then it would find this local connection and then it would DMA the content to the receive buffer. Interestingly, that NVMe capsules, don't, they don't have any security. So there is no authentication of the uh, source of the sender. Uh, if the packet, so like this capsule reaches the receive buffers, it will be executed. So these capsules just have uh, data and the ID where it should be written. So actual location where it should be written. There is like no authentication of the, of the sender. But it actually means the whole authentication of the sender happens on the device. And that it happens on the moment of just checking whether the connection exists. So if we can impersonate uh, a connection or like connection that is privileged to write the device, then we can actually send any request to that device. And now we'll show how it can be done in InfiniBand based protocols. It actually happens because of two vulnerabilities that exist in InfiniBand based 
architecture, like InfiniBand architecture. So first of all, it's how applications or the kernel modules work with RDMA capable devices. They, they actually send special requests to create connection on the device. So as I said, connection exists on the device and it does not actually exist in the, in the kernel space. So the, the, the application, it would just says the device, please create me an endpoint connection, which is called QPeer in InfiniBand. And the device would just create the connection and says, oh, I created unique connection 100 for you, which is of course unique only within this local device. And then the user, it always can say, oh, actually I want to use that connection to send to somebody X. So it would provide information about the, the, the other endpoint. So it would be connection ID and routing information. And the device would just create it. So because it's just local operation, there is no communication involved. The device just creates it. And it's responsibility of the user create a proper connection that it will work. But the device will just do it and no, without, like, without any extra questions or warnings, it would just create connection you want. And the second vulnerability is more like core vulnerability in the whole packet format. If you look closely at the packet format, you could see that actually the packet has no information about the sender. It has only information about connection at the receiving side, which is defined by QPN. So it doesn't have connection ID of the sender and only connection ID of the receiver, which actually, if you think about it, makes sense. The connection is point to point. You don't need actually ID of the sender because you could always get it from the ID of the receiving side. And the, when the packet is received by the receiver, Nick, it, it will actually just check its local connections, which are unique rather than going remote connection that are not unique. So uh, that's the core vulnerability that, uh, that exists. And now we'll explain how these two facts leads to injection without administrative privileges. So let's imagine we have this remote machine, which has um, RDMNIC with address 1.2, and it has a connection AB. And this connection, for example, can be created by the NVMe target application. And then imagine we have a user which is allowed to establish connection with 1.2. It would actually uh, just create this connection. It would ask the device create a local endpoint. It would get, for example, connection 100. And then it would say, oh yeah, I'd like to use this connection to send to endpoint at the address 1.2. It's actually connection AB. And uh, the device will just create it. So, and then in theory, this user can already send the packets to the remote site. But actually can be also done. So the adversary can also ask to create a connection to the device. Of course, this device, uh, this connection would have completely different identifier because it should be unique. So for example, get ID one, one, two, three. free. But there is nothing prevents uh, the attacker to say that it wants to use this connection to send to the same endpoint, to the same remote connection. So the device would just do that. It will not check that, oh yeah, actually it has a connection to the, to the same address. It would just create it. So overall we have like two uh, applications that have almost identical connections, but they different in this sender identifier. But actually once this if, if the application would send the message over the network, once the packet leaves the port, it becomes indistinguishable. Because as I mentioned, there is no information about the sender and it has only information about the receiving side, about the target side. So they would have the same routing information. They would have the same QPN target. They would, of course, the, the payload specified by the application, but they would be exactly the same. So what it means that the, the attacker, it only needs to know the remote connection ID, which is actually can be easily predicted because all the devices uh, do not randomize it. It's sequential, it starts with uh, the same uh, 
value, which is the same after the reboot. And then it's special dangerous for NVMe or fabrics because usually this kernel module created on the boot. So usually uh, the, this uh, target application, it would get the IDs uh, which are really at the closer to this initial seed. And this initial seed is actually is a really small number. It's again, depending on the device, but it's, it's around 200. So you just would need to enumerate like 200 connection identifiers. And we have sequence uh, counter. So of course the packets uh, should be processed in order in Finiband architecture. But actually the sequence counter is just 24 bits. You actually just need a few seconds to enumerate the sequence number. And then we actually could successfully do it. If you think about it, you just spend a few seconds on the enumeration. And then you could actually change the content of the remote NVMe. So we think it's really low price for such privilege operation as just changing the content of a block on an NVMe SSD. Of course, uh, this attack also goes to the other types of requests. So it's not only write and capsule, but just for general writes that are targeted for sending large payloads or like changing many different blocks with, uh, as well as it works for NVMe reads, which use writes for reads. And they actually, in, in the work, in the paper, we describe different scenarios or like different attack vectors that can be used using this impersonation. So for the RD, uh, for this in-capsule writes, you already know we can manipulate source data on the remote disk. But for reads, we could actually manipulate what the data is read. So we could actually falsify the, the data which is read by the client without changing content of the data on the remote NVMe. And for writes, we show that actually we can have, uh, we can enforce race conditions, which would lead to DOS attacks and the various uh, um, disconnections and, uh, and like, and, and having different consequences on the work of the applications. All these attacks that we described in the paper and explained today, they were tested for two most popular implementation of NVMe fabrics. It's a SPDK, which runs in the user space, as well as Linux kernel modules, which it's NVMe and NVMe target. So they were tested and they work. So right now you wonder, okay, actually there was recently a proposed new specification, which adds security to NVMe. And uh, actually the specification offers you two mechanisms for protection. The one is in-band security, which actually doesn't add you authentication of each request. It just prevents from establishing connections uh, between clients and targets. So they could actually challenge each other to check whether they allow to create a connection. But as we showed for our attack, we don't need to create a connection. We just impersonate somebody else. We don't need to have a connection to the target or to the client. We're just impersonating, we're reusing existing connection. And uh, there is like proposed IPsec. Uh, it exists actually for Rocky V2 protocol. You could use IPsec protection, but actually we retry the same attack when we use IPsec and we could still perform them. And the reason is because IPsec protects only uh, from IP to IP, from port to port, they do not protect connections individually. So actually, steel packets are indistinguishable and it has the same problem. So IPsec is not capable solving this problem that was introduced in InfiniBand architecture uh, when they removed the source QPN from the packet format. So overall, for this model that I explained this TLU local user, we could still perform all of these attacks when we have uh, these security features enabled. Also in the paper, we describe model TRA when the attacker is actually residing on a remote machine. In that case, actual IPsec would protect because again, it's from port to port. And then if you're sending from different port, from different IP port, we will not be able to inject the traffic. So this, it will protect only against 
uh, remote attackers. But once we have a local user, we could actually perform all the attacks and there's nothing that would prevent an existing specification, existing implementations. And what is surprising that actually we could protect, we could actually mitigate this. Uh, we would like to address but the fact that there is no security, but somebody could add it. Even in our previous work, we're saying that it's impossible to have application layer security in general for RDMA because these requests are bypassing the OS, they could be fully executed by the network controller without evolving involvement of CPU. But how it is used in the NVMe protocol, we can actually do that. So because the requests, they're bounded by two requests, by two RDMA sends, we could actually piggyback authentication code in them for the payloads, which are sent with this one-sided read and write requests. So overall, what we think that capsules should include message authentication codes, and there are like some rules. So to prevent uh, attacks, what, what we say that the message authentication code should be sent in the send requests that can be reached and processed at application layer, and the data that is sent over one-sided request should be included in the MAC calculation. And when we check the Mac, we could we should actually make these buffers immutable. So we have to make sure that nobody modifies them after we checked message authentication code. On that, I'd like to finish my presentation. I would be happy to answer your questions.